Episode 55. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Our guest tonight is Josh Turner. Josh, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Happy to be here. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I was born in Taylor, Texas. That's where my encounter took place. I now live in Austin, Texas. I run a security business. It's a pretty large company here in Central Texas. I have done a lot in my life since my encounter, and I just decided that it was time that I should share that encounter because I'm getting older and <laughs> thought it was important. I'm glad you did decide to come forward and put that encounter out there. Josh, you've told a fair share of people about your encounter. What kind of responses have you been getting when you did that? Were they all negative? No, it wasn't all negative, but it it definitely wasn't positive when I was younger. It definitely uh, got me in a few fish fights when I was young because it happened when I was 15. And, you know, when you're a teenager and you tell somebody that you saw the wolf man, people are going to mock you and kind of belittle you, you know, and so I had to kind of, uh, got a few fights, you know, over that. <laughs> it definitely wasn't positive when I told my mother and, you know, other people, they just kind of thought that, you know, I was excited and I'd seen something else. Yeah, that's got to be one of the hardest parts of seeing one of these things, having to deal with things like that afterwards. It's never easy. Because of you sharing the details of that encounter you had with maybe one friend too many, you've acquired a unique nickname. Please tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah, my nickname is Wolf. It started because I had told a few guys that I played ball with, you know, that this had happened. And so they thought it was funny and they started kind of mocking it and calling me Wolf Boy and stuff like that. Over time, the nickname just kind of evolved just into Wolf. I'm a physically large guy, and I was always big, you know, and I was pretty athletic. You know, it just kind of stuck, and over time, the meaning or or how I got the name just was kind of lost. Nobody ever really asked anymore. They just figured it was because I was a big, strong guy, quick, whatever. Do you regret being called Wolf now or wear it like a badge of honor? Definitely a badge of honor. I mean, everybody knows me as that. Even my parents call me that. Most people that I work with in the security business, even my clients know me as Wolf. Everybody just calls me that. When you say Wolf around here, everybody knows who you're talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> If you could single out one aspect, what's been the absolute worst part about you seeing that dog man? Um, I think it was because it was very traumatic. I don't know if it was it would be considered like post traumatic stress, but I definitely had like nightmares for years, you know, and they would come and go and they would just like reoccur out of nowhere and I would just have these nightmares and I would see this thing over and over again, stalking me or whatever. That was probably the worst part about it, you know, and then to a lesser degree, just being apprehensive about wooded areas, thinking that I was going to see something, that was pretty much it. Well, like I told you through the pre-interview as you were sharing all these things with me, I'm almost to the point where I can finish sentences for eyewitnesses such as yourself. It's funny how when I'm talking to an eyewitness and they're telling me about the things that they're going through as a result of the encounter that they had, a lot of eyewitnesses seem to think that it's just them who are going through that. When I share the fact with them that pretty much every eyewitness that I speak with is going through the exact same after effects, seems like it always makes them feel a lot better. It's always good to know that when you can share something like that, you can help that eyewitness feel better, especially that quickly. All right, Josh, please tell us about the encounter you had. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, well, it was on Halloween night of 1990. I was 15 years old. I was with my friend, Dave. We had gone egging 
because <laughs> I live in a small town, and that's what we did. So we were out taking cars and, you know, and acting like hooligans, I guess. My mother had given me a curfew to be home by 11 o'clock. It was already almost midnight, and so I called my mother from my friend's house to tell her, you know, I'm on my way home and try to get her to give me a ride. Of course, she was like, no, you get home now. And so I knew I was in trouble, probably going to be grounded. But I figured, you know what, I had, a, I had a fun night. It was worth it. So I got ready to start walking. Me and my friend went down to the Circle K that was right there on the corner, like right around the corner from his house. When we were leaving the Circle K, he decided he was going to walk me to a halfway point to where my friend lived. My friend had, uh, him and his brother would work on bicycles. And he always had uh, like two or three of them outside, you know, and he always let us, like I could borrow one and I was going to ride the bike the rest of the way because it was probably about three or four miles or, or I guess about, yeah, two or three miles actually to my house. And so, so we're walking and talking and we get up to the corner and uh, this house on the next block over, at the end of that block, there was a house. The guy that lived there was a young couple. They had two German shepherds in the backyard, and they were always barking and any noise or whatever. I thought I saw one loose sitting in the ditch in front of their house. I strained my eyes, and I thought, is that a dog? The guy that I was with, he stopped me. Like he, I just kept walking, kind of straining my eyes, and he kind of grabbed me by my shirt. and He was like, that's not one of their dogs. I don't know what that is. From a distance, you know, from a from a block and a half, I guess, I guess it would be probably a block and a half away, it just kind of looked like a dog. Once we got to the end of that first block, then it was just a block up. That's when I, I it came into focus, like what it was. It just, it wasn't a dog and it wasn't the neighbor's dog. I realized this thing was really large. Just to be sure, I tried to call it like, you know, come here, you know, whatever, you know, made a noise. This thing turned its head and faced us. That's when I realized this is not a dog. This isn't a man. I don't know what this is. And, you know, being that it was Halloween, people would say, well, maybe it was a guy in a costume. Well, like I said, it was midnight. Why would this person be sitting in a ditch in a small town where there's nobody else around? I just thought, you know, this is odd. This thing is just sitting there. And if it was a person that's sitting in a ditch, and so, as we walked a little bit closer, this thing stood up. It didn't stand up straight. It just kind of hunched over. And that's when I realized that this thing had a, had a, for lack of a better term, a wolf's head and uh, what looked like a person's body. Both of us <laughs> just kind of froze. And the next thing you know, my friend is bolting. He's running. And I'm, I'm just standing there, like, in shock. And I was, you know, I turned and looked, and my friend had already, like, ran halfway back to his house by the time my legs started moving. So I took off running, and uh, I, I had, like, a, one of those fountain drinks in my hand, and I remember just feeling wetness on the bottom of my legs because I guess I had dropped it, and I didn't even remember doing it. When I got to the yard to my friend's house, which was about three or four houses down from where we were at, this thing, had, there was a fence, like a chain link fence between the neighbor's house and his house, and there was just an old couple that lived in that house. So obviously they were asleep. It was like midnight. This thing was in their backyard and it went up to the fence. And when I got to the house, that thing was right there, uh, probably about 30 yards or, you know, 30, 35 yards from me. And I saw it like clearly. I mean, it was dark, but I could see it. It was kind of a smoke gray color and it had like really, uh, reflective, like yellowy looking eyes. I remember the eyes. I don't remember a smell. It didn't, I didn't smell anything. I don't think I was close enough to smell it. Thank God. But I remember it hiking its leg up like it was trying to put its really bizarre looking foot into like the fence to jump over it. And then it kind of gripped the fence with these weird looking hands and shook it like it was trying to balance itself or something. And I guess it was just going to leap over it. And I was like, Standing there, petrified, and just staring at it, and instead of moving and going inside, which I should have been, I was just staring at it, and I didn't know, I guess because, you know, it's, it's like, I was so scared, I was scared to move, because I thought it might trigger it jumping, and it looked like it could just reach me. So, 
I stood there kind of shaking, and I've never, my legs have never shook like that. You know what I mean? I just remember shaking. And, and finally, I heard my friend on the porch telling me to come inside, and I just bolted. This thing had to have jumped the fence because as I got inside, we started looking out the windows, and I, we, my friend had already told his mother. And then his mother was in the kitchen, and she screamed. And his little brother was behind her. He came out crying. And everybody was freaking out, and my friend's dad had gone to get a, his shotgun, and um, his older brother, you know, was was in the back room. He came out, and everybody's looking out the windows, and my friend's mother, it was like she was going to have a heart attack. We didn't know, still didn't really know what it was or how to describe it, you know what I mean? It was just like, my, my friend just kept saying, we saw this thing, it's outside, and my uh, friend's mother, being very religious, you know, and... and like I said, she was Mexican American, and she was, she was like it was the devil. But the way she described it, she was just like I just saw the devil. So my friend's dad and his older brother went outside, and uh, I guess the thing was gone. I guess it looked in the window and then just left. They went outside and they didn't see anything. They didn't find anything. Well, the next day, early in the morning, my friend's brother and my friend and me all went outside and we saw these weird looking. Uh, footprints right outside the uh, window, the kitchen window. It had been a lot of rain, so there was like, it was kind of like like muddy right there. There was like a patch of ground or whatever that wasn't grass. My friend measured from the ground up to the window where his mother had seen it and said from that point from the bottom of the ground was seven feet, five inches, which uh, pretty much, it, it, it wasn't a man. We know that. That's my encounter. That's what happened. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, probably two days until I could actually sleep again because that night I just remember like trying to go to sleep and I just couldn't. It was just like I just waited until daylight, you know, and I just, I don't know. It was, yeah, it was pretty traumatic. Oh, I'd say. I'm foggy on a couple of details here. I was hoping you could clarify them for me. You said you dropped the soft drink you had and you felt that wet sensation on your legs and did that without noticing it because you were so shocked by the dogman you were looking at. You turned and ran. At that point, you said you were about three to four houses away from your friend's house. Once you got almost in front of Dave's house, you looked into the neighbor's backyard and that's where you saw the dogman with its foot on the fence. Is that right? Well, yeah, and I, I got a good look at its leg, and it was just weird looking. It had this, like, backward bent leg, and the foot, I remember this part. I don't remember a lot a lot of details, but I remember it putting the foot on the fence, and it, like, it didn't fit, like, the chain link fence, like, its foot was too awkward or something. I was glad for that. Yeah, thank goodness. What you saw, it sounds like it must have been a canine-type dog, man. With their ability to jump, if it wandered over that fence, I can't see it taking the time to bother doing what it was doing. It should have just jumped right over that fence to start with. I'm sure that's what it did when Dave's mom looked out that window and saw it right there outside looking in. I should clarify that that fence was not a one of those short, like, five-foot chain-link fences. It was one of those, like, taller ones. It was like, this thing towered over it. It was a taller fence. And it was old, kind of dilapidated on one side. But that spot where it was at, it was still straight up. And uh, I just remember because the people that lived there before, they had, like, dogs in that yard. And I guess that when, that, when that other couple, that middle-aged couple moved in or whatever, they were in the process of renovating that place. And I just remember, and that place is not there anymore. They actually tore it down and rebuilt another uh, house there. But that fence is gone. But it was a taller I don't know exactly how tall, but it was probably tall as I was at that time. Ew, that had to be one heck of a sight to see. Yeah, no wonder you didn't get any sleep after living through all that. Did Dave's mom seem to have an easier time dealing with seeing it than you and Dave did? You know, over the years, she only talked about it. I remember talking her, her talking about it like maybe one time. And uh, that was me, one day when me and my brother went over there. And she, you know, I, I brought it up and I think it kind of upset her, you know, but I wanted to 
prove my point that, that I was being honest about that. You know, and my brother listened to her tell her side of it. She was upset. She began to cry when she talked about it. But afterwards, she said that it felt better to talk about it because she had been keeping it in for years, you know, not really speaking about it. Yeah, she passed away in 2010. And uh, I think that to the day she died, she probably thought about it. Oh, I'm sure she did. And I, I think that Dave adjusted to it better than I did, or at least he seemed to, because he didn't, maybe there again, he didn't really talk about it. The only time he would ever talk about it was to me. And if I ever told somebody with him, he would just confirm what, yeah, you know, which is probably why he didn't get razzed as much as I did, you know, because he didn't like to talk about it, you know. He was one of those people that believes in, like, if you talk about something, you talk it up, you know what I mean? Like, it comes. but. I never subscribed to that. There might be something to that. I sure hope that's not the case, having a show entitled Dogman Encounters, but <laughs> I, guess, <laughs> I guess time will tell. <laughs> Did the fact that you saw that dogman inside the city limits of your hometown make the situation easier or harder for you to handle? I would say harder just because I grew up in the woods up until that point. I had only been living in town for about four or five months and that changed everything i mean like i thought if this thing could be in town even though it is a small town you know if they can wander into town or live in town somewhere you know i mean they could be anywhere i mean anywhere i mean doing security i've like heard noises and dumpsters and stuff and it was just raccoons but i'm thinking what if it's one of those things you know like that anxiety is always there, and I, th I do make, I believe that it made it harder for me. That is one aspect of this whole dogman topic that so many people miss the boat on, the fact that these things do come into city limits and do their thing, especially at nighttime. I know of sightings in the daytime where dogmen were seen walking up the middle of streets and everything. Well, shifting gears here, one night when you were on a security detail at a Lowe's, you had a scary experience. What happened that night? <laughs> yeah, what, back in 2005 or 2006, I believe, they were trying to open a Lowe's, and uh, they were having lots of problems. The area where they were at is a recharge zone for the Edwards Aquifer, and so the city has a lot of restrictions for businesses that open, you know, and so... They were having problems, so they had a fire watch, which is 24 hours, pretty much. We had to be there per the fire department. And I was working 14-hour shifts, splitting with another guy that was doing 10. And uh, I was doing the night shift. It was a pretty easy gig. And um, I remember it was Halloween, and uh, I was listening to a radio show, and they were talking about werewolves. <laughs> so I was, like, intrigued. I was listening, you know, because ever since my encounter, it, it, that, that piqued my interest, you know. Prior to that, I don't remember ever even having any real interest in anything like that. But um, I was listening to the show, and I had to go do my rounds, which I had to drive around the back of the property. And when I drove around the back of the property, it was just a heavily wooded area back there for probably about half a mile until you got to the next highway, which was Mopac. That's one of the major thoroughfares here in Austin. When I got to the back of the property, I had to take a leak. And, you know, so I got out and I walked to the edge of the woods and was starting to do my business. And I heard, like, football, you know, like, twig snapping. I could tell it was a four-legged something because of the way it sounded. And um, having grown up in the woods, I know what it sounds like. This thing was coming toward me, and I thought, whoa, this is creepy. You know, I was just listening to this show. <laughs> and so my mind was working overdrive, and uh, I thought, could it be something, you know? But like I said, I knew it was like, it sounded like something on all fours. So I stopped what I was doing and started heading back to my truck and I see this white flash. And I turn and I look and this this large German Shepherd dog, pure white German Shepherd. And it was coming full sprint at me and I jumped in my truck and this thing got up on my uh, door and was barking and snapping at me through the window. And uh, I had a mag light in my hand, so I grabbed it, and I went to, to hit this dog to get it off of my truck. And I ended up hitting the, the top lip of the ceiling of my truck, and the flashlight backed and hit me back in the face. And uh, 
this dog was snapping and barking, and I was driving my truck at the same time. I was hitting the gas, and I almost went off into a ditch, and I, and I finally got my bearings, and I, and I managed to smack it on the snout a couple times, and it fell back, and I rolled my windows up. You know, I had electric windows, whatever. And uh, I, I got away from it, you know, I drove around to the front, and I was like, oh, my God, that was that was freaky. It was crazy. And then I noticed that it did bite me. It had bit me on my wrist. I still have the scars. So I didn't finish what I was doing, so I kind of finished in my pants. <laughs> it was like, I mean, not, not not a huge wet spot, but I mean, I did, I had peed some, you know, so I had to, so I figured, you know what, I might have been myself all night. I was a lieutenant at that company, and nobody ever checked on me, so I got out. I took my pants off, and I tried to, to dry them on the engine, like above the engine, you know, hung them on the, the hood, and uh, took my shoes off or whatever. Just then, you know, because I didn't see the the patrol truck driving up because I had my hood up, you know, and I look and I see these lights and they're already right up on me and I'm like, oh, no. The one night that the patrol guy would come by there and he was training a female officer who I'm still friends with to this day and I'm sitting there in my boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> they pull up and they're like, uh, did, did I interrupt something weird here? <laughs> I was like, I said, no. And I tried to explain myself. I said, look, dude, this looks weird. But then I told them the story about what happened, and they laughed. The patrol captain, who I actually work with now, he in, a, in another at this company, he actually works for us, he went around the back to go check. He didn't see anything. And I sat there with the female officer, and I, I said, can you give me a minute? And I put my pants on. And uh, one day, she was in the office, and she was telling her son that story, and they, were, they got a good laugh out of it. And I, I did have to go to the doctor the next day, and I had to get rabies shots <laughs> because that thing did bite me. Yeah, with it acting so aggressive, it sure makes you wonder if it wasn't rabbit or something. Yeah, you know, and like I, I saw it again one day about a week or two later, and, and I was around the side of the, the building, and I, when it saw me, it kind of came toward me, and I went and got in the cage because those lows, they have those cages on the side where they keep lumber and stuff, and I just got inside of it. And it went up to the fence and barked at me, and then it ran back into the woods. But after that, I was like, you know what? I'm not walking around this property at all. I'm just going to be in my truck. But, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask that question about that encounter later on in the show, but it's just so good of a story. I thought, you know what? Let's get to that pretty early on in the show. You said Dave was with you when you saw the dog man that night. Did he become a preacher as a direct result of seeing that dog man or for other unrelated reasons? He, you know, it's funny because he was not religious at all. And I had, I had been baptized and in, 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 uh, accepted Christ a long time before that. And his mother was very religious, like I said. And he would kind of just like give her a hard time. And him and his dad both were not on the path, you know what I mean? And uh, I always was, or at least I tried to be. Years later, you know, as his mother, her health began to decline due to diabetes, he accepted Christ, and uh, one thing led to another. The next thing you know, he was training to become a preacher. Now he's an ordained minister, and he has a church there in my hometown. I asked him that question directly. I said, what led you to this path? Yeah, I think it did influence him because he did tell me once that, that he he believed that we saw something evil. And having witnessed that, it was like God telling you, look, these things exist. That's his belief, now, you know, his opinion. I respect that. I don't know that what we saw was completely evil. It just, you know, it could have been just a natural evolved creature. I don't know what you would call it. But, yeah, I think it probably did influence him some, you know, in my opinion. Well, if seeing something like that doesn't lead you to religion, I guess nothing will. Yeah. <laughs> but you said Dave's wife's family had something attack a mare on their farm. Please tell us about that. Yeah, and there's a smaller town. There's all these little smaller towns, there's little farm communities and, and, and uh, little ranches and farms. And, and this smaller town outside of my hometown, her cousin Ricky owned a, uh, a ranch. And, uh, well, it really, it belongs to him now, but at the time it belonged to his parents. And they raised horses out there. They had a few horses. There's a lot of people that have farms and, like I said, around this area. And then a lot of people have livestock. And I was raised around that, you know, around cattle and horses and stuff. And when he first got with her, but back before he became a preacher and was going to church and stuff, they were living in a house that had some, uh, paranormal, I guess, activity going on. She had witnessed it too, 
one night they were talking about it and he opened up to her and he told her the story and um he was telling me that he thought maybe she would think he was off his rocker or something but he figured you know after what they had seen or whatever that it wouldn't it wouldn't be that far fetched you know that she might believe him it's one of those things where you know you can't tell many people like you got to get it off your chest at some point when you're with somebody you're going to be with you know cuz they got married and um he told her and she didn't even think it was strange or anything. She didn't bat an eye about it. She just told him a story that she later told me. The way she told me was that Rick, and I know him very well, um, I've, I've met him several times, they had a, a colt that had just been born a foal. It, it barely had gotten its legs. It was only probably three or four days old. And they found it tore up pretty good and something that eaten part of it. And I, it looked like maybe the mare had tried to protect it or something. And it had a really bad bite, you know, like on, on its back, like something had attacked it, and they had to put her down. That, when they, and they attributed it to, like, maybe a mountain lion or whatever, but these people, having lived out in the country, they recognized that this was not the work of a mountain lion. The, the jaws were just too big. The bite marks were just too large. And so a couple nights later, something had broken in and, and slaughtered some chickens. So they decided to stake it out for a few days, and eventually they saw this thing coming out of the pasture, out of the, the woods on the edge of the pasture. And uh, it was Rick, his uncle, and or his two uncles and his dad, and uh, I guess his little brother too. They saw it, four or five people, they saw this thing come out of the woods walking on two legs. They shot at it. According to her, they said that they hit it, and it fell over but then it got up and, and loped away on four legs and then got up on two legs and ran back into the woods. It had to be a dog man. I mean, I don't know what else could do that or would look that way. You know, they said that it was like canine, you know, like a wolf. So, you know, that's that story. Yeah, it's awfully hard to imagine going through something like that. I'm sure they must have sold that farm shortly after they saw that dog man come out of the woods that night, didn't they? No. No, actually, they didn't. Ricky still owns that land, but he doesn't live there anymore. Yeah, they moved out, but they lease it out. People who run their cattle out there and stuff. It's got two really large pastures, and my dad's family actually owns some land adjacent to that, which is kind of creepy when you think about it, you know, because back when my great-great-uncle had passed away, I was considering buying some land out there, and I'm kind of glad I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say I'd blame you knowing what's out there. What can you tell us about the howling that's been heard around a place called Lake Travis? Yeah, Lake Travis is a large body of water. It's part of the lower Colorado River. I had several accounts out there back in 07 to 08, or no, 06 to 08. And uh, it's, a, it's an area where a lot of nice houses were being built at that time during the housing explosion, you know, before the bubble burst. Everybody was building houses everywhere. At that time, there was a subdivision that I was doing security for, and I had about four accounts out there. There's this large restaurant that overlooks the lake, and um, it's a pretty popular place. And uh, the guy that owns it's a millionaire, and I was working for him at that time. And uh, I was doing security for that place and then the subdivision that was adjacent to it. Me and some of the guards that would work out there at night, we would hear this strange noise, and one of them was my best friend. His nickname is Scorpion. Everybody calls him Scorpion. But he's a pretty big guy. He's like me. He's been in security for a long time. He started out working for me about 15 years ago at the nightclub I used to manage. But he's a big, tough guy. He was a bouncer. He's not afraid of anything. And uh, we've been in a lot of fights, man. Believe me. So there was a, uh, a horse ranch not too far from where we were working. I can't remember the name of it but off the top of my head. But the, the lady that lived out there, she owned some horses. One of them had been attacked by something. The veterinarian that they took it to said that the bite marks were canine. But nobody's going to believe that a wolf is going to attack a horse that size. So the sheriff's department had been flying, and they said that there was a possibly a mountain lion out there. So we were out there. We're armed. You know, I just told my guards, I said, look, just be, be careful. You know, when you're doing your rounds, whatever, out here, because there is woods all the way around there. My friend, you know, he's one of my best friends, he knew about my encounter, you know, and one night he told me, he's like, man, 
I was hearing this howling, and it just sounded so uh, bizarre. He goes, it didn't sound like a wolf. And there were coyotes and wolves out there. And he said, and I know it wasn't no mountain lion. Because when a mountain lion makes this noise, it's almost like a woman screaming. And we'd heard it before. We'd heard the mountain lions out there. There There's some out there. He said, this thing was not a mountain lion. I don't know what it was. And one night when I was out there with my brother, we heard it coming from the woods. And, it, and you know what? It almost sounded like a like a man doing it. But it sounded just like a like a howl that you would hear it off of a movie or something. It was just bizarre. And it made the hair stand on your back of your neck. And I knew, man, I just I looked at my brother and my friend and I said, that has to be, you know, one of these werewolves. Because we call it a werewolf. We don't know what else to call it. I mean... I don't, I don't, we never call it a dog, man. We just say werewolf. There's a lot of people in this area that I didn't realize how many people actually have heard these things and have heard so that people that lived out there and heard that howling and thought, man, what is that? It's just a bizarre sound. Yeah, when you hear one of these things howl, you would swear that there's a huge werewolf out there in the woods doing it. Although dogmen look just like werewolves in almost every way. I guess it's kind of hard to separate the two, but anyway, you did a lot of things in the woods before you knew dogmen existed. What kind of activities are we talking about here? Well, my dad worked for Alcoa. It was a power plant that was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. The town I used to live in was Rockdale. That power plant out there, a lot of people in that town worked out there. My dad, he worked graveyards a lot. Now he's an electric engineer at Samsung. He basically would leave me at night as I was raised. He would be like, you know, Harry, you're out here in the middle of the country. And I was out there by myself sometimes. Mom and dad had separated. And I was probably like 10 or 11. I wasn't supposed to, but I would grab my 22 out of snake charmer. They call it a snake charmer. And I'd go tromping around out in the woods with my friends, you know, that lived down the road from me. We would go out in the woods in the middle of the night and go just exploring, hanging out, doing whatever. And, you know, I never thought twice about it. I never thought ever that something like that would exist or be out there. It never crossed my mind. You know, the only thing I was ever worried about was stray dogs or maybe some coyotes. Since I was a little kid, they might be a little bolder, you know, or something to attack you. One time I was walking through the trail and just a stray Doberman, like, ran out in front of me. And I was by myself. And I had a pistol with me. I had a little twenty two pistol, too. And I thought, am I going to have to shoot this dog? But then it just ran in its wood. But yeah, I, I used to tromp around out in the woods all the time. Of course, sometimes you'd get like a prowlers, which that's a strange thing too. You get these rogue people that just wander around. And one night, me and some friends are walking down this gravel road, and this guy just walked out in front of us on the road and, and crawled through the barbed wire fence, and he had a backpack on. And I'm like, dude, who is you know, this scruffy looking dude just came out of the woods, you know? And we're going like, who is this guy? And of course, we're sitting there with guns, you know, and this guy just said, oh, good evening, and just walked by us and just kept going. And we're like, wow, he just walked across that pasture. He had to be careful. Like, there were people that would just wander around. And I guess it, it's a, it happens. My, my grandpa would always say, be careful for prowlers, you know, because I guess them growing up in the Great Depression and stuff, people would wander around asking for work and stuff. You know, looking back on it, I'm like, man, if that guy knew what kind of stuff was out there, he wouldn't be wandering around like that. Oh, yeah. If he knew what was out there, I guarantee he wouldn't be out there roaming around the way he was. You mentioned that you work security for a living. How has that encounter affected your ability to do your job? Being honest, I have a lot of accounts where we do security for construction companies. I, and a lot of times they're, they're adjacent to woods or they'll clear out woods to, to build these complexes. I don't like it. I don't like uh, working overnight anywhere where there's a lot of wood, you know, area. And if I do have to work it, I just try to stay closer to the road or whatever. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll do my job. I'll do my rounds. But, yeah, I'm very apprehensive, you know. And, and uh, any time where there's woods or whatever, I don't park anywhere near that. and I don't go toward it. Since that, it's happened to me this last 25 years or so. I don't mess around the woods anymore. I don't go hunting or fishing or anything like that anymore. I don't do any of that stuff. And yeah, that's pretty much, uh, it's, it's kind of changed how I look at things. I mean, like how I do my job. I'm definitely on the you know, high alert when I'm out at night. You can't be too careful. After you had that encounter, have you done anything alone in the woods? 
And if so, if you did, how'd you do? There's an area called Devil's Backbone in between San Marcos and Blanco. I had a girlfriend that went to school there. It was in Texas State. At that time, it was called Southwest Texas. And uh, she was always like, let's go camping. Let's do this. She grew up in the woods. And I finally did go camping with her the whole time, man. I tell you what, it was anxiety. I had some guys that I worked with downtown. And uh, there's one friend of mine. He kept badgering me to go hunting with him. And I finally did. And I tell you what, I never did it again. Every time, everything I saw, everything that, that I never noise I heard, I was thinking that it was going to be one of these things. And before everybody else made it back to the truck, I was already back at the truck and waiting for them for a couple hours because I just didn't want to be out there, you know. That's probably maybe one other time in Oregon I went hiking. And other than those little couple of times, I just, I've stayed out of the woods for the most part. Like I said, if I do any of those things, it's like anxiety, you know what I mean? I feel like it's pretty much hampered any kind of activity like that for me. I just don't do it. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm spending every waking minute jumping at noises, but I don't uh, I don't uh, make it a habit of going into the woods, you know, because I just feel like if these things are in town, they're definitely going to be out there. Yeah, more of them out there in the woods than you'd ever imagine, I'm sure of that. After what you had been through with that encounter that you had, being antsy when you're out in the woods that way, that's totally expected. So, yeah, don't second-guess yourself for a second for feeling that way. That's totally normal. Switching gears here, you had your encounter when you were 15. You're about to turn 40 now. If you had that encounter now, do you think you would do anything differently? Um... As soon as that it was in town, I don't think I'd be just walking around with a gun. But if I'm out in the woods, I'm definitely armed or doing anything. Like like when I went hiking in Oregon, I took my pistol with me, and the girl that I was with was like, why do you need that? And I'm just like, better be safe than sorry. You know, and I told her, well, maybe because it's black bears or something. I didn't tell her why. But I just feel like if I saw that thing today, I don't think that I would have been as frightened because I'm a lot bigger and stronger and, and I think I would have, but I would have definitely not frozen up like I did. I think I would have just went straight into the house and maybe grabbed a gun or something. But having seen it that close, I know I probably wouldn't go back outside and try to fight this thing or confront it, I can tell you that. So I don't know what I would have done differently. I mean, what, what can you do? I mean, I don't recommend anybody trying to fight one of these things, I can tell you that. Yeah, trying to go out there and fight that thing, that wouldn't be a mistake you'd have a chance to repeat. What do you have to say about people giving eyewitnesses a hard time for not getting good pictures of cryptids like dogmen when they encounter them? That's a question right there I know you've got some strong opinions on. When it happened to me, there were no cell phones. There wasn't cell phones back then. There wasn't, uh, there was no camera. You're not going to be walking around with a camera. And people who have cell phones and have cameras, when something like that happens, your instinct is, not, well, I'm going to stop and take a picture of it. If you have time to take a picture of it, it has time to get you and turn you into hamburger meat. I don't know who's going to sit there and try to take a picture of that thing unless they're really foolish. Because there are people who see these daredevils on YouTube, like, taking selfies and hanging off the side of a building. There might be some fool like that that would do it. But who's going to do that? I mean, who's going to have time to sit there and try to take a picture of one of these things with its camera phone? I don't see anybody being able to do that. I mean, if you tried that, that would just be the height of stupidity because that would probably be the last picture you ever took. Oh, I agree. Yeah, trying to claim that you'd be cool, calm, and collected enough to snap a pic of one of these things if you ran into it, that's one thing, but putting yourself in that situation and proving it, that's a totally different situation there altogether. You said to this day you look into shadows when you walk around at night because you're afraid a dog man's going to jump out at you. Tell us about that and what it's like for you. Well, because it happened in town, I know that those things can be anywhere. Like I said, 25 years, I haven't spent every waking minute thinking about it or being afraid or anything like that because I'm not, you know, I'm not completely afraid of just after 25 years, the, the fear subsides somewhat. But like I said, I am apprehensive. You just, it, it never leaves you. That feeling never leaves you that, that, that these things are out there. 
And one thing I know is when I looked at that thing, I saw intelligence in, in its eyes. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't the same as looking at a wolf or a coyote or a, or a bobcat or something. I've seen all those animals, and it didn't, I didn't see the same level of intent and intelligence that this thing displayed. And so, yeah, when you're walking around taking out the trash or whatever it is you're doing, you, you think about it. I mean, I guess it's in the back of your mind. But it's nothing you can, uh, you can cure. I mean, I don't know. I, I had a lot of anxiety as a teenager after that, that incident. And I, my parents didn't really understand why I had a lot of the problems I had. And, uh, I ended up in therapy because they thought that I just had mental problems or something, you know, like, you know, like something had happened to me traumatic, but they didn't know what it was and they didn't believe that that's what it was. They just thought that that story was just part of me having these problems as a teenager when in fact that was the problem, if that makes any sense. Oh, that does make good sense. Unless they had had an encounter themselves, they couldn't have a clue on what you were going through, what it was like, so... Yeah, I'm not surprised that they struggled to understand you and what you're going through there. It's unfortunate, but it's pretty much what I would expect. You've got a friend who told you about seeing something that he referred to as looking like a small werewolf. Please tell us about that. Yeah, that was my sister's boyfriend. They lived in a house catty corner from where we lived. And he was a weightlifter, and he's the one that got me into weightlifting or whatever. I was working out with him one day and his younger brother, his younger brother who knew about the encounter because he was good friends with me and Dave, he uh, basically had just told me, he confided to me, he's like, you know, my brother saw something like that. I'm going to try and get him to talk about it. I had told this story to him a couple of different times and he seemed intrigued and he never really made fun of me. So I thought, you know, maybe he believed me. Well, one day when we were working out together, his brother brought it up. My sister's boyfriend he just kind of looked at his brother and looked at me, and then he just kind of sat up on the bench. You know, we were working out, and uh, he's like, you want to know about it? I'll tell you. And he told me, and I was glad and relieved somebody else close to me had had a similar experience. And in my hometown, there's a, a place called the Hiking Bike, and there's these little bridges, you know, that go over these, like, uh, little tunnels or whatever. And uh, he said that one day when he was riding his bike, he saw this, at first what he thought was a kid, like a child, on the edge of the creek messing with something. That spot in the creek is where there's all these snapping turtles, and we used to go in there and we'd grab them. Probably shouldn't have been doing that. You'd lose a finger, but we were always messing around doing stuff like that. And then when I would go to visit my cousins and stuff, we'd go down there and we'd mess with these, these turtles right there. And I don't know if that's what it was messing with, but he said it was banging something on the ground. And as he got closer, he realized that this, this what he thought was a child, had like a wolf's head, and it had like a little scrawny body on it, which I can only assume that it was like a juvenile or something, which means that there's probably some sort of breeding population. I don't know if that's what that means, but, you know, he said he saw this thing, and he got off of his bike, and he positioned the bike in between him and the thing, he didn't tell me like how, how close in proximity he was to it, but he said that he was about to take a left right there at the bridge where, where he was at, which I know where he was at. It, it, there's like a T, but it comes to like a T on the trail. And if he would have went left at that spot, that, that he would have had to go all the way around through these neighborhoods to get home instead of just taking a right and going on to the road where he lived. And so he was like, he was like, you know what? That thing scared me. And he said once it saw him, it just kept its, its eyes on him, and then it ran under the bridge, and it came around the other side. And when he was getting on his bike, he looked back, and he saw it kind of like, the way he described it was, it kind of hopped. And it came up out of the, out of, out of the, off the bank of the creek and, like, jumped out in the middle of the street. And he said he was just hauling his buns, you know, to get out of there. <laughs> and he said he kept looking back, and he almost wrecked his bike. Luckily, it didn't follow him. But he said it was probably about three feet tall. But it did uh, make me feel better, and I told my friend about it, and he was like, wow. So we knew we weren't the only people that had witnessed this thing. It wasn't just me and his family. But, um, yeah, that was that was really odd. I mean, and it, it, that, I tell you what, man, that, that was, uh, it was creepy to think that, man, there's more of these things. But at that point, I was just glad that somebody else had experienced it. You know what I mean? Oh, no, that makes perfect sense. 
Like I've said before, Misery does love company. That's just human nature. So that does make good sense. What really scares me is the idea that if that little one was right there, I'm sure one of its parents or both of the parents were nearby, probably watching him at that very moment. That's not a comforting thought whatsoever. And that's what he said, too, Vic. He was like, I just had the feeling that there was more of them around because there's woods all around. He was like, man, he just kept thinking, man, I'm going to see a bigger one. I'm sure when I first told my mom, because when I told my mother about the story, it was at the dinner table, and my mom was just like, Mentira, which is like, she me also, which is like liar in Spanish. <laughs> she was just like, ah, Mentira, so I don't want to hear this. And my sister just kind of laughed about it, but he didn't laugh about it, and he, he just kind of like, kind of looked at me, which made me think, man, this guy believes me. And then, like I said, a couple months later, when he told me what happened to him, that made sense. And I knew he wasn't lying about it, you know, because of the way he stared me in the eye. He was a very, very matter-of-factly guy. You know, he was a, always working out and stuff like that. And we're still friends to this day. It made me really appreciate that what I saw, I knew I wasn't crazy. I hate the idea that other people had to have encounters with these things, but in a way, I'm glad that you had people around you you could talk to about your encounter, and in turn, they could share the details of their encounters with you, so that you could kind of, in a way, commiserate. It's not pleasant to think of it as, as being commiseration that's helping you, but in a way, that's what it is. Your friend Mike invited you to his house one day about three to four days before Christmas one year. When you got there, he told you that his dad wanted to talk to you about something. Please tell us about the conversation you had with his dad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was actually his grandfather. My mother's Hispanic. In Mexican culture, at Christmas time, we always make tamales. His grandmother would always make big batches of tamales, and she would give them away kind of as Christmas presents. So every year, we'd go over there, you know, like a couple of days before Christmas, and she would give them to the neighborhood people. So I went by there to get some. And, uh, and you know, you wait all year long for these because some of these people, they can just really cook, you know. So I went over there to get some, you know, and uh, when I went in, you know, there was a couple other people that were up there getting them, whatever. When I went in there to get mine, my friend's dad met me at the door, and he said, hey, my dad wants to talk to you, which would have been his, uh, my friend's grandfather would have been, you know, his dad's dad. And uh, so I went inside, and I, I sat down at the table, and I waited for him. And he comes out. At this point, he was already getting on in years. He was a metal worker, and he had a lot of tools in the back of his shed. And I remember when we were kids, we would play around there. And uh, he would always tell us, out of the shed, you know, and stay away from there because he had a lot of expensive tools and stuff. And uh, his grandkids had actually messed some stuff up, so he was always telling us to stay out of the backyard or whatever. He had this shed right next to it. And the metal on the shed had been, it looked like it had been peeled back, you know, like something or someone had tried to tear it open, you know. And it almost looked like somebody had taken a crowbar and messed with it for like a while, but then couldn't get in. So I always wondered about that, but I never asked. So when he sat down at the table, he said, uh, he said, my grandson told me that you had a, a weird incident down here, you know, right around the corner over here. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He goes, I, I want you to, to listen to what I'm going to tell you. And I want you to know that I believe you. And so this was a year later, a year after that. I was like 16. And uh, he told me that back in 1978, he had gone hunting because in hunting in deer season, whatever, people, this, everybody goes hunting. Everybody has a gun. But he went out and he went hunting and him and his brother had killed a buck. And they had taken it to that shed, the one next to the, to the shed where the tools and stuff were. And that they had dressed it, you know, whatever, they had uh, skinned it, whatever. And they left it hanging back there, whatever, overnight. And uh, they were going to get back to it the next day and finish cutting it up, whatever. And uh, he said that that night, he heard banging, clanging metal, like ripping, whatever. He looked out the back window, because his back door, I guess, had a window at that time. It didn't when I was a kid. There was a really thick door there. At that time, there was a, a window in the door. He said, I used to have a window in the door, and I looked out the window, and I see these two, what I thought were men, tearing open the shed where that deer carcass was. And he thought, at first, these guys are ripping him off, trying to steal his tools. But then he realized that these guys weren't messing with the tool shed. They were messing with the uh, deer shed. He said he opened the door and hollered at them, 
And of course, he had his, he had a gun with him, a shotgun, a double barrel shotgun. Before he called me, you know, he goes, "I had a double barrel shotgun." And I opened the door and I said, "You better get away from that shed." And he said that when they turned and they looked at him, that they both turned and looked at him simultaneously. He said that these were not men. He said one of them was probably about six and a half feet tall. The other one was about seven. And he said that they looked at him and he saw that their heads were like dogs' heads. He said that he goes, it looked like a werewolf, like you would see a werewolf. He said that they were tearing open that shed and that the smaller one got down on all fours and jumped toward him and he managed to close, he tried to close the door and this thing banged up against the door and right when he did, he unloosed both barrels and he managed to close the door right after that. You know, he said that he didn't see whether he hit it or not, he just opened fire. And he fell backwards because when he shot, he said he shot from the hip. And so the, the recoil, I guess, it knocked him backwards. You know, he said that it, it normally you would have time to raise a gun and, and shoot. But he didn't have time. This thing jumped across the yard so quick. And then it blew in the window. It broke the glass. He said that he was laying flat on his back. And his wife and his son came into the, the room. And the kids and everybody woke up. And they were like, what's going on? And he's like, somebody's breaking into the shed. And his wife saw it, too. When she looked out the window, she saw this thing looking right at her in the window. And she described, she was there, too, when we were talking, and she described the way it looked. She said it was just ugly. The way she said it was just very ugly. She said it in Spanish like fail, you know. And um, he said that, uh, that he was, that, you know, he was afraid that this thing was going to be able to get into the house. And that, that room, that back room was their washroom. Um, and I've been in this house several times. And he showed me where it happened. And he said that they closed off that, that next door, that closed that room off or whatever. I don't know if it got inside or what happened, but he did say that he heard the door handle, like, like shaking, like this thing was trying to manipulate the door handle. That story, like, just, it's, that, that story, it scared me, you know, but it was more confirmation that I knew something that was unique to me and that these things had been around our uh, town and in our neighborhood for a long time. You know, I began to pay attention and listen, and, and I talked to several people about things. And there were the old timers, I guess you could say, the older generation. They didn't think it was crazy. They didn't mock me or anything like that. Most of the grief I got was from people my own age. But that was a that was a crazy story. Oh, I'd say yeah. It sounds like from all the encounters you've been hearing about that took place in that area. Travis apparently has had a long history of dogman activity. Seems like it's almost a hot spot for them. Yeah, that would actually be Williamson County, Vic, but it's, it's adjacent to Travis County. Yeah, I know that there have been other sightings in Travis County. I know that because I've heard of it. I've heard people talk about it. They've seen these things. I heard a story, which I can't confirm, but there was a, a friend of mine's girlfriend that claims that her uncle saw one down near Shoal Creek, which would have been like, on the edge of town. Of course, he said he saw it years ago, which would have been at that time, like in 1980. I just remember her saying that. And, you know, and it was like we were all hanging out one night after we got off in the club, and it was a friend of mine who I'm still friends with, and it was his girlfriend at the time. She claimed that her uncle had seen something like that down drinking water with his hands. That would have been 1980. There wouldn't have been a lot of houses around the area because often it's blown up. And now, you know, there's people living everywhere, but, but at that time, there wasn't. So, I mean, yeah, Williamson County, Travis County, definitely I've heard a lot of stories about these things. Is that the creature that the uncle described as looking like a giant hairy gorilla? No, that story, my great aunt, actually, she lived in the south side of Taylor in my hometown. My hometown is, is known for cotton, like there's cotton land. It's just like there's a bunch of cotton fields everywhere. And there's a, there was an interchange of railroads at that time, and there were people that would come down to work on the railroads. And uh, that's actually where my grandfather came from. He came from Chicago to work in my hometown on the railroad. And uh, my great aunt, my mom's aunt, she just passed away recently. Me and her were very close. And she had told me a story that there were these people in, in this part of town. That, you know, back in the old days, things were segregated, and this was the black part of town. It's not really that anymore. It's more integrated now. There's different people everywhere. But at that time, the railroads bordered the black part of town. And 
then further down, there was a, a large Hispanic community that lived on the very edge of town. And that's where my mom's family lived. And my great aunt said that the black people that lived in that area would tell them not to walk down by the railroad tracks at night because, as they described it, there was a hairy gorilla creature with a baboon face that was actually killing hobos or bums that would ride the rails, you know, back in the old days. And this goes back like the 50s and 60s. And that every now and then they would find somebody that had been attacked or killed. They always just chalked it up as, oh, you know, two drunks getting into a fight. Somebody stabbed somebody. But these people down in that part of town believed in this thing, whatever it was, and that it would catch these people that would ride the rails and sleep in these boxcars and that it would kill them, you know, it would eviscerate them. They uh, described it as looking like a, uh, a hairy gorilla with a snout. So when my great aunt told me that story, she herself had not seen anything like that, but she did tell me that, that she believed it because there were stories going back to when she was a, a teenager in the 40s and 50s and up into the 60s that that was going on. There are several of the older generation that confirmed that, that I had talked to over the years that said that. My friend's dad, I guess he's almost 70 now, when I had my encounter, my friend Dave's dad, he brought that up to me, and so that's why I asked my great aunt if she knew anything about it, because she lived in that part of town for most of her life, and she confirmed it. And my friend's dad believed that whatever we saw was probably one of those things people were seeing around the railroad tracks. Yeah, my great aunt, she actually told me a story. There was a bridge on the, uh, I guess it would be the north side of town, the northeast side of town. It's called Hoxie Bridge, and there's a lot of urban legends about it, stories. Somebody goes out there and they go missing or get killed or something. My friend, there's the San Gabriel River. My friend's great uncle Gunter, old German community out there. They've been out there for a long time in that area. And that's actually on my dad's side. That's where my ancestral home is. That's where actually my great grandfather was born, right on the banks of the San Gabriel River. The stories out there, Hoxie, is that there was a black panther. And that sometimes people would be driving their tractors through there and that this thing would leap up on the tractor and, and pull them off or attack them. And, and a couple times through the years, people had gone missing. A guy, I remember a, a story that I had heard that someone's child had gone missing. And I was talking to my great uncle one time and they were talking about someone's family. And they said, yeah, he's the one that, whose kid went missing out by Hoxie. It kind of piqued my interest, you know, and so... My great aunt told me a story. She said that she was driving through there one time with her uh, husband at the time. They were arguing. And she said that she just looked out to the side of the road as they crossed over the bridge. And she saw this, what looked like a black cat standing on its hind legs, just standing there. And she said that it was so creepy and scary and it made her blood just freeze. She said that she believed me in what I had seen because she saw that. Gunter had told me when we went down there one time to go fishing, be careful, man, there's this panther out here. And I believe the way he described it was, like he said it, like they called it, uh, I can't remember the name that he called it. He said a German name, like Panzermann or something, or Panzermensch or something they called it, you know, in German. The way he said it was a panther man. There was some sort of weird creature out there. I just figured, well, you know what? What I saw, if it could exist, that thing could exist. It was just a very creepy area. Like, when you go over that bridge, the trees are kind of down on it. And that bridge is dilapidated now. It's no longer there. There's just a paved road now. It was one of those wooden bridges. When you go over, it makes that noise. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. I've walked over that bridge and been over there now. It's condemned or whatever. But it's a, it's just a creepy spot, man, you know. And the story there was that that's what lived out there was the Black Panther or whatever. And like I said, I can't confirm that because I didn't see it. I just know what people have said and what they've told me. I just thought maybe Gunter was trying to scare us. Like, oh, be careful out here. We went out there fishing. And that was probably about a year before I saw this dog man thing. I, I thought about it later on. I was like, wow, that thing could have actually been out there. And I mean, I, he wasn't probably just trying to scare us. He probably was just warning us. As if having dogmen running around out there every place you turn wasn't bad enough, now you have to worry about cat men running around out in the woods. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Josh, yeah. Travis is not a place I want to even visit. Oh, it's a nice place. I mean, it's just maybe these things have been here a long time. 
that's how I look at it. Like, I mean, these things are probably ancient. I mean, you could speculate all day about what it is. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to tell you these stories, because if anybody out there could ever give an explanation, maybe we could find some sort of specimen or something, then we could confirm these things. They're going to be awfully hard to pin down to the point where you can ever prove that they exist. But, yeah, I see where you're coming from there. Please tell us about the herd of cows you saw that night that were bunched up against that barbed wire fence. What do you see that night? Yeah, see, and you know, if I had never, and this is the thing that big, if I had never seen this thing when I was 15, that incident probably would have just been like, it would have, I would have never even thought about it again. I remember I was like 11 years old. I collect baseball cards and I had gone into town to trade with my friend Ronnie. I came back home late. Of course, my dad had already gone to work and uh, it was probably like, I don't know, 10.30 or 11, way past my curfew. And my dad, I'm sure, was already mad. But of course, there wasn't no cell phones back then. So anyways, I, I was walking my bike down the dirt road because I had a backpack full of uh, notebooks and baseball cards. So I had it like slung over my shoulder and I, and I couldn't navigate my bike on this gravel road because some of the walks were kind of big. This was outside of Rockville where I used to live when my dad was working at the power plant. And uh, I came home kind of late and I was walking my bike down this dirt road or whatever. And I had done it a hundred times. It didn't even, I didn't think twice about it. But I heard these cows making noise and uh, mooing. And they were all bunched up against this barbed wire fence. And I thought, what the heck, you know, why are they all bunched up like that? And I could see them, even though it was dark, you know, the moon, I could see by a lot of the moon. And I saw them, like, just kind of making a bunch of noise. And they were all cows. You could just tell it was all a bunch of cows. And uh, it, it, I just was like, what, you know, what is spooking these cows that they're all bunched up against the barbed wire fence by the road? That's not normal behavior, which is indicative of a predator. Because I've been around cows my whole life. Even when I was a little kid, I used to ride them. You know? I used to get on them and ride them. So I was thinking, there's something spooky these cows, you know. And so I'm walking along, and as I get around, the, there was like a curve, you know. And when I got around the curve, I see this shadowy-looking thing, you know. And I didn't get a good look at it, you know. I didn't get, like, a. I just saw this, this black, dark shadow. And um, I heard, like, twigs snapping on the other side, and I didn't see the cows when I came around the bend. They were all on the other side of that curve. And it, it, it was inside the barbed wire, like, close to those cows, but they were all bunched up behind some trees. And this thing was on the other side of the trees. As I was walking my bike, I stopped for a second and kind of strained my eyes, and I was trying to, to see what it was. It looked like a really tall man or something, and I was like, what in the heck is that? And so I just kept walking. And this thing seemed like it began to parallel me, like it was walking alongside me or whatever. From the way it, it sounded, it sounded like, it, you know, it was like football was heavy. You know, you could hear it snapping twigs and stuff. And then I heard kind of a grunting noise, and I was like, what is that? You know, so, and I got it back on my bike, and I just nav I just tried to navigate through the rocks, man. I just <laughs> took off, man. Right after I had that encounter when I was 15, that's when I thought back on that. I thought, man, I bet you that was one of those things, man, because all that time I spent running around out in the woods and stuff, I never thought twice about it. And I told my friend that lived in that area, I said, man, I had a weird something happen the other night. And he was like, you know, I, he's like, I, that's happened to me too. You know, he was telling me that he was walking around in the woods one time and he heard something like following him on the other side of the uh, barbed wire. And uh, he thought, you know, he heard the cows like mooing and stuff on the neighbor's pasture. And he thought that there was maybe a, a predator or something out there. He said, but he saw through the tree line it was on two legs. And we joked around, like, well, maybe it was Bigfoot. Like, we thought, you know, maybe it was a Sasquatch or something. But I can't confirm what it was. And, you know, and people say, well, when you see Bigfoot, or there's a smell. I didn't smell anything. I just thought it was odd. It was just a strange experience. And looking back on it, it could have been. But then again, it could have been a Bigfoot. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it was. Sometimes it's best just not to know, and in a situation like that, I think that would apply. In the pre-interview, Josh, we talked about some of the things you've done in your life. You don't impress me as a guy who's lived a boring life at all. Have you ever been as petrified as you were the night you saw that dog man? No, I can honestly say that. I worked in a nightclub downtown, and I, I got stabbed. I've been stabbed twice in my life, actually. 
I got stabbed during a fight. I got into a fight with this guy, and I'm not bragging like I'm some really tough guy, but I am. I, I can fight. That's one thing I've always been. I yeah, boxed for years, and uh, I ran a nightclub. It was a pretty rough place. It's a hip hop club, and uh, it, it's the largest dance club here in Austin. It's three levels, and we packed the house you know, on the weekend. And I've had some pretty hairy situations. Like I said, I got stabbed one night, and I went unconscious on a Saturday night. I woke up on a Tuesday in the hospital. And I wasn't afraid at all during that whole affair. It was just adrenaline. You're fighting and you're, you know, whatever. And this guy stabbed me. It was just one of them things. I've been shot at. And that, that's happened to me, too. And it just that scared me. But nothing that's ever happened to me has ever put the fear of God in me like that thing did. Because I've never seen one ever again since then. Maybe it was just because I was young. Maybe I look at it sometimes and I think, well, maybe now that I'm older and I've more experience and I've been through all kinds of stuff. Because I'm a big person. I'm a big guy. I'm almost 6'4", and I look weight every day. I'm a big dude. And I, and I swear to you, this is the truth. I weigh 494 pounds. I'm a big guy. And I'm pretty mobile for a big dude, man. I'm an alpha male, for sure. You know, And I just don't look at any human being as anything to me. Like if I were to get into a fight with somebody, it doesn't bother me. When I know that I'm going to win. But this thing, whatever, there's, I, I just don't know any anybody, no matter how big or strong or tough you are, that could stand up to one of these things. Big ones, anyway. Maybe one of them little ones, you know. But, <laughs> you know, this bigger one that I saw, that thing is just, there's no way. That that put a fear in me that will never go to the day I die. I mean, it, it will always be there. I just... I don't know anything that's ever happened to me in my life that has made me with that level of fear that I experienced that day. I mean, there's just nothing. Nothing that's ever happened to me. Oh, yeah. In the course of a lifetime, you're going to experience things that are going to scare you really badly, but nothing's going to compare to something like that encounter that you had. Well, Josh, it's almost time to wrap this show up. Before we do that, though, I wanted to have you talk about these nightmares that you've had. For years after my encounter, they would come and go. It wasn't just like every night I would have these. But I had night terrors, and uh, I would just wake up just sweaty and just, just literally drenched in sweat. And it felt like I had been running a marathon. One of the dreams that I would have, or I should say nightmares, that's what they were. And I know and it was weird. It could happen in broad daylight. I could fall asleep, take a nap, and I would wake up dreaming about this thing. One of the nightmares I had, I was laying in my bed, and something grabbed my foot just to wake me up, and I heard my brother's voice. And I woke up, and I looked to put on my bed, and this thing is about to bite my foot. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I woke up like, oh, my God, you know. But that there was one recurring dream that I had over and over again. I was standing on the porch of this house, and there was this really tall grass out in front of it. I would see this thing popping its head up and looking, and, and then it would go back into the grass, and I couldn't see it. And I, my legs, I couldn't move my legs. I was stuck, and, I, and it kept getting closer, and I'd pop its head back up, and I'd see it. And every time it would come up out of the grass, it would be closer. And I kept thinking, then i got to turn and get inside this house, but I couldn't. I couldn't move. And, you know, I had that dream over and over again, that dream. It was just recurring, you know, like it, it would, you know, and then, like I said, it would come and go. It wouldn't happen for months, and then I would start having it again. And eventually, it would get right there up on me, you know, and then I would always wake up. It got, it got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm dreamy. Wake yourself up. The dreams plagued me for a while. It's hard because you can't always talk to people about these things. I had a therapist for a while, and. I didn't feel comfortable telling him, hey, you know, I'm having dreams about a giant werewolf. What do you say? He's probably going to think, oh, this guy's crazy. I was just like having anxiety. Like I said, I go to a post that I work in or something, and it's next to a wooded area. I'm just very apprehensive about being close to it. I don't know how I would react now if I saw something like that. But uh, I'm pretty sure I'd be just as scared as I was then but just maybe a little better at handling myself, you know, maybe getting away or something. But, yeah, the nightmares, that's one of the things that I'll probably have till the day I die. I mean, the last time I had one was probably just three months ago, but they're not as, as frequent now, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's just one of the many strange things about this whole dogman phenomenon. 
For some reason, eyewitnesses frequently will have repetitive dreams about dog men. It's the same dream, night after night after night. Sometimes that'll go on for years. It's just one of the many things I'll never understand about them. Josh, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I would like to say something about that, the dream. You get a feeling of, and I, I don't know if this is common for ever other people, but I've always had this feeling of impending doom. I don't know if that makes sense, but like I've just always felt like something was about to happen. I don't know, man. It just I always felt like with the dreams, I always kind of felt like the one that I saw wasn't happy about me seeing it, if that makes sense. And I always thought maybe I'm on its radar now. You know what I mean? Like you get this feeling of impending doom. Like, you know, it's like you shouldn't have seen this thing and it's, going to stalk you or something, which I know is crazy and it's not. I mean, I'm sure, but I just always kind of had that feeling since then. And it comes and goes. Like, I'll just, won't think about it for a long time, and then one day I'll just go, whoa. I don't know. Like, maybe it was a bad omen or something. I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, me being superstitious, but I just feel like it wasn't a good thing to see that. I would advise anybody, if you're going to go tromping around out in the woods, I hope you're proficient in firearms. Yeah, I wouldn't just recommend carrying a fishing knife with you because it ain't going to do nothing. And if you are going to shoot at one of these things, at least like the one I saw, you better be far away from it because you may just make it mad. And I, w- I would recommend anybody who's seen it to talk about it because it's so therapeutic to talk about it to people who understand and believe. Yeah, talking about it, it does seem to help a lot. When they can actually come out and share ideas and experiences with you about how they're doing, how they feel about various things now that they've had that encounter, seems to always help, whether that eyewitness at first thinks it's going to be of help or not. Well, having said that, Josh, I can't thank you enough for coming on and telling us about that encounter you had and sharing all that other info with us. I really do appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you giving me a chance to voice this because it definitely makes me feel better than knowing people like you are out there, Dick, and I think you do a good service to a lot of people who normally wouldn't have a voice. And I appreciate you uh, giving me this platform. Well, thanks for the good words, and thanks again for coming on. Yeah, giving people who have seen these things a venue to come and talk about their encounter, that's what this is all about. I'm always glad to do that. Well, Josh, you have yourself a great night, and thanks again for coming on. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.